I put sorry. Hey, good morning, good 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 afternoon, good morning, or good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, depending on the time, of course, you are watching us now live on uh, multiple channels. It's really great to be with you. And if you take a break now to watch this live transmission with us, as uh, I'm sure many were registered to attend in advance, and it's now the time to go live. So I hope that you will be. With us, and of course, if if you're not able to catch us on live right now, you will be able to watch this recording on the multiple channels where we are right now. J not just my my personal stream on LinkedIn, but also the YouTube channel of the Digital Collaboration Academy and the Facebook page of uh, Digital Collaboration Ac Academy too. So, uh, without further ado, let me just introduce here my two guests. I'm I'm still also expecting Lin Guang. Lin is probably going to join us any minute also. But uh, with me today, I have Jeremy Liu uh, by order of uh, alphabetical order. Uh, and Jeremy is the, the founder and the CEO of GroupMap Technology, a company that builds, uh, 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 oh, Lin is just joining us in a few minutes. Uh, 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 GroupMap is a, um, a group decision support uh, uh, platform that's uh, the core of our uh, training and certification course in the Digital Collaboration Academy, and uh, that Peter Say is going to talk in a minute. But Jeremy is, is a, a, um, a renowned facilitator, also an IF member, which I'm very proud of having his membership in the association as current director of conferences and events in the IF. Uh, it's very, very good to have you on, on the association, Jeremy, as a member. And also, he, he, he produced a wonderful uh, fire chat, uh, fireside chat conversation during the uh, OFU and facilitation week. That's the background we are actually using. And, and it's based on this conversation and the subject of this conversation and the discussions we had that we are going to uh, uh, talk about during this uh, live stream here. So thank you so much, Jeremy, for being here with us. My and, pleasure. Uh, and it's also so great to have here with us uh, Peter Se. Peter is uh, Hello, uh, evening. A, a renowned, renowned facilitator. Is 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 he was actually also my assessor when I did my CPF exam uh, two year, almost two years ago. So I have a special connection with Peter because he's is the person I know with the the most uh, in-depth knowledge on not only uh, 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 digital facilitation, but also facilitation as a whole, as a core discipline. Peter is also an expert in organizational learning, uh, in training, and also in, org in change management. He is the member of uh, several scientific societies and also uh, uh, a CPF and a member of the IAF. And is also the chapter leader in Singapore, where we are now going okay. to... I'm going to invite also to this conversation Lin Young, which is a CPF also uh, from Singapore, I believe. Lin, uh, you don't have the, your camera on. So as soon as you can have your camera on, we're going to be able to see you. But anyway, while, while Lin is uh, firing up her camera, maybe we can start up with this, uh, uh, the, 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 the whole idea of this uh, uh, virtual event you organized, Jeremy. What was behind, uh, what was in your heart when you planned these uh, fire chat chats, uh, both in one in US and another in, in Europe, right? Right, yeah, so um, that's a great question, actually. What inspired me to run that was we were, there was a survey that was done um, I think as part of OFU and overwhelmingly when we were reading through, I think there was something like a hundred or so hundred or 50 questions. A lot of it was around that sense of connection and how do we stay connected? What can we do? What can we do to engage people? How do we um, ensure that they're participating? How do we ensure equality and equity? So a lot of that came back down to humanizing the digital experience um, so the idea was to reach out to people that have been doing exactly that and for them to share their stories, their experiences. Uh, we ended up having quite a lot of people in that panel. So we did have to split up into the two time zones. And also it was really interesting to kind of compare and contrast how culturally different um, things were as well. But I can talk a bit more about that later. But uh, in terms of inspiration, it was really the sense of, Yes, we're a we're a, 
a tool, an application, a software, but um, it, it, I was inspired to create that software when I was teaching face to face in the classroom. So it's never left. It's never left the soul of the product. It's never left the soul of, of why we exist. Fantastic, cool. Uh, well, let's talk about also cultural implication on facilitation, Peter, because you're from Asia, and and you have uh, you're an experienced facilitator and consultant. You work at many different uh, uh, companies all over the world. Uh, do, do you notice that culture can have an impact on facilitation on the way we uh, get uh, results from groups? Um, Paul definitely. Um, culture definitely has an impact great impact you know primarily because you know culture is a manifestation of how group come together it is a symbol of when group gets together their habits their thinking and even their their rituals you know formulate the artifacts and we can see it some are visible some are not visible and in a way we can call it culture for example um one thing i do notice in my in my traveling and working with uh, different groups um, I think definitely uh, in the West, people are a bit more uh, more open, more direct. That a lot of time makes a conversation a lot more easy because you really speak off the mind. But in Asia, um, I, I wouldn't say not, not all parts of Asia, but for those that I connect largely, right, there's a certain reservation because there's a certain respect for uh, the superior, the elder. You know, I cannot be speaking ill of them. So whatever things I do, I do make a hint, you know, uh, make an indirect speech. Yeah. So there's one aspect. Of course, that makes conversation a lot more harder. But on the flip side, for example, uh, being open sometimes can be more confrontational, which I expect. That will be a group where I work with, uh, where there's a mix between a, a so-called the Western and Eastern culture together. All right? You can see two groups are actually interacting differently. However, I must say that because, oh, you know, because of the evidence of internet and we are very connected. I think this gap is getting uh, closer, I would say. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a, a word and say that there's a wide margin. In fact, I would say it's much closer now. There are a lot more uh, openness. And as we cross boundary to learn from one another, especially in the nine months of COVID, right? We, we have no choice but calling internet. I think that had brought the, the world closer. I think the culture is no longer so much of uh which part of the world you come from but maybe is your mindset how you deal with issue yeah fantastic peter it's 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 so good to hear that and and lean finally where you are here with us lean Wang, uh cpf from uh, uh from singapore Hi, Aline, you are muted you are on mute hi hi everyone hi. and and hi i'm paul jeremy hi peter I'm so glad that Lin can join us here because Lin, Lin is one of the very, very first certified group map facilitators. So she's uh, with us. And, and surprisingly, Lin is also a, a CPF like me. Surprisingly, she's also, uh, of course, a consultant in, in change management with lots of background and experience on that, as you can check from her LinkedIn profile. Uh, and Lin is not just a uh, um, uh, uh, a CPF, but he's also uh, uh, someone that uh, practices future foresight facilitation. I just attended uh, recently a, a workshop um, conducted by Lynn and April uh, from the Singapore chapter, and they uh, surprised me with uh, the professionality that they address this future foresight facilitation. So, Lynn, tell, tell me a little bit do you think that Group Map could be a good tool for future foresight facilitation? Hi, um, yes, I, I think so, because he, I like that group map has this um, has different kinds of templates that we can make use of, and it allows us to add on uh, new our own templates also. So that's the flexibility there. So I think that definitely uh, group map is something that we can use for our foresight facilitation work. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. So Jeremy, back to you in order to try to follow the circle here. You mentioned before that you like to talk about the experience between uh, US and Euro. What, what was the main difference you, 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 you encountered in the, in the conversations you hosted on the Fireshot chat? Uh, sure, last sure. Week? Um, I think I have to give some context, if I can, around who was actually in the panel. So in the US panel, we had um, 
someone from Deloitte and someone from Issaca, and they were running a virtual conference with 600 people in three different time zones, all different chapters. Um, and they humanized the experience by wanting to, they, they were used to having all 600 people in the room and that was not going to happen. So they tried to recreate an excitement and engagement factor by making it like a production. So they went to the effort of dressing up, having teleprompters, talking to the, the audience, calling them out like they would on a talk show. Um, the presenter came out and she was dancing to the music. They had um, everyone take a group photo, which became the backdrop and it, sort of a cinematic experience, but to give them a sense of space. So there was a lot of effort that was done in that regard, even though they, I mean, they were using group map to do a um, how now wow and a saw analysis. So there was still work to be done, but the way they tried to engage the audience was through their own energy and, and bring themselves and their personality to the, uh, the overall uh, conference. And, and that's how they did it. That's how they tried to personalize it. Things that they were also doing for next year was you know giving people food vouchers so that the people could share a meal together and to then um, use the sense of uh, participation in their activities to to feed into the next chapter so then people felt like there was flow from one region to the next so that was that was something that came out of that group um, in slight contrast we had uh, Tim Mary and Tuesday from the outside group and a lot of their work from humanizing the experience is actually dealing with homeless people, you know, on the streets, um, with with social workers, with change management in in trying to have equity through the system, you know, and making sure everyone had a voice. Um, and so their work is very deep. And they didn't bring this up at their fireside chat, but something I've noticed that they did in their own workshops was they would share their own personal story about say a conflict or a fight between themselves and how they resolved it and how that that argument or that that personal conflict could be um present in a meeting and how how to deal with that as a facilitator mm. um so their their perspective was again they used lots of other ways very creative ways so for example, they had one of their team members use all the words that had come out from their brainstorming activity in group map. And then at the end of the session, they created a wrap. And they just had someone wrap back all the key messages back to their group. And it resonated with that particular group. Um, they used art and dance, but more so in the choice of music. They would use music to bring that storytelling in. Um, and so I found that that was kind of the the US version was kind of really deep, really sort of engaging, using as much of it as possible. With the um, with the EU uh, style, we had well, we had yourself, Paul, as you know, because <laughs> you were there. Uh, we had Thomas, who um, is uh, in that sort of consulting management and strategy side of things, and then we had Malud, who is an agile retrospective coach and the techniques and strategies that they used in their work seem to be a lot more uh, process driven and understanding the need for privacy through to build, excuse me building um, rapport giving people a chance to speak and um, and techniques to bring that out <laughs> Jeremy, I think I just, yes, you need a glass of water if you don't have it close to you. Oh, you have it. Okay. That's cool. Yes, definitely. It was interesting, like a background of different um, uh, approaches and different concerns when we talk about humanizing meetings. Peter, what's your view on humanizing meetings? Um, I'll, I'll give a little uh, different perspective. Um, I think for me is really back to the basic, you know. I think technology is something we are very excited about. I, I, I personally am very excited about technology. Uh, I must say in the nine, past nine months, I have been uh, scrambling to learn different types of way to connect digitally. But then when you actually set it down in the screen, it's still about what is the issue in the room? 
what is the the outcome that we want to achieve, right? So I would say the the way to humanize uh, a conversation is really to look at first the outcome, what the outcome the group want to achieve. Uh, for for a certain reason, I would like to share another uh, sessions I did for five hundred people, quite different from what Jeremy shared. Uh, if I were to use the dancers and songs, I think I would feel very miserably because the issue was about uh, connecting the passion of the participants to the, the vision. So what we have done is in these 500, uh, I divided them into 25, some 30, and I have to classify them into leadership and non-leadership because generally if I put the leadership with the, the, the non-leaders, conversation will not be ex exciting. So the first cut has to be separated. But what we do is that we painstakingly build the conversation before they come into the room. We already connect them to uh, um, uh, another platform too, where we can explain to them how they be connected. And we ask them, what is one reason why you come to work? What would that be reason be if it's not there yet? And then we bring this conversation to the room and we make the connection. And with the platform technology, I have some participants who are 50, 60 years old, even near 65, 68. They, were, they do not know how to use even uh, the handphone, but it was trying very hard because they were so passionate about the topic. Yeah. So that is the first factor I would say uh, to humanize the conversation is look at the connection. And the connection is about the outcome. Right? And in the outcome, I'd like to share another point is, uh, which is the point, there's an outcome that is different from the word effects. You can have an outcome, but what is the effect you're trying to achieve here? For example, most of the time you're focusing on the processes only. I must say, even in the early days of my practice, I'm, I'm very uh, cue on to making sure I do step one, step two, right, right? I'm not concerned about what is happening in the room and that I will call the effects. What do you see in the room? And if I ever connect that effects in the room, that's where the power will come. So whatever tool you use, all right, of course, the tool is important, definitely, but normally the tool has to work with the, the effects. And for that matter, I must say, uh, I find group map, there's certain features inside that connects it very well. So one quick example will be, I could change actually the, the process on the fly, right, behind the scene when I'm doing, and I love that part because I can continue to talk, you know, recognizing that things change, and behind, I can walk my fingers, tapping through the process. And the participants will just go with the flow without knowing it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's my sharing, Paul. Okay, thank you so much. And how about you, Lin? How, how do you go about humanizing your meetings? Um. Well, I think Peter and uh, Jeremy has shared a lot. Uh, I think for for me, I think my sessions usually I. I ask, how do I say, um, humanizing it in a sense is like really calling them by name so in the session. So intentionally, uh, when I invite people to share, I'll call them by their name. So and then because I, I, I like to use two different uh, laptops and have different screens for my uh, sessions. So at least I have one screen whereby I can look at their faces or expressions. And then I have another screen whereby I'll look at a, a collaboration board. And then in that screen where I look at the faces and when you ask them questions, saying sometimes when you see their uh, expressions or you see that they have like question marks on their faces, then you ask them, uh, then no, that's where how I do that. Like, I like to do that and really call them by name. Uh, that's one of the ways. Uh, other ways I like to do that is like, I guess it's like, um, uh, so it depends. Sometimes it's like learning sessions or sometimes it's a uh, facilitation session. So usually it's like, um, like for some learning sessions, so actually we design in the engagement along the way so that at least uh, it's not something that uh, on the f like you just like out of the blue you, you think you want to do it, but it's like you design into the con um, the whole lesson plan such that it becomes more engaging for the participants. And I know that uh, I am intentionally engaging them so that at least they will not feel like um, they are like just um, they're listening. Yeah, these are some of the ways that I do. Thanks. Interestingly, and that, that trick of looking at the cameras, because obviously the technology can give you a further assistance than we could think about, right, Jeremy? 
Yeah, I'm terrible at looking at the camera. So I, I, I <laughs> so <laughs> so now I must be wary when I talk to Lin on the screen. Maybe he has this body in screen looking at my face. I better powder up before I, I make her in the screen. <laughs> but definitely, on the other hand, I find that um, for virtual, actually, there's a more, lot more concentration on the facial. It actually, in some way, is better than on, on site. You know, sometimes in the on site, when I, my eyes have to do 180 peripheral looks, I can't see participants all the time, right? I have to move my head. But then for virtual, I can actually zoom in. So in a way, it's actually a lot more engaging sometimes. Be able to really eyeball the person, you know, to see the trick in the eyes, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. very interesting, yeah. I actually find the best humanizing part of the meeting is before the meeting actually starts. So when, when we start the work, we've now got our objectives and the goals, of that, but before that meeting starts, even though some people think that first 10 minutes of getting ready or, you know, warming up is a pain, just that general, like, hey, how's it going? Um, I heard you did that, or, you know, I'm sorry to hear that that happened in your family, like something that you've known about them, that bit is where the human element begins. And then it's like, okay, oh, man, we really should start the work now. Hey, okay, let's, let's get into it. So um, with my team, when we run our meetings, we just, for some reason, we have an unwritten ground rule where we always have to find out what someone's eaten, what was the last thing they ate, where <laughs> it's like... Food is such a big thing, so we have that as our our question. That's, that's amazing. Okay, I, so flowing the conversation, who wants to add something else? Because I have also here some questions from group map uh, participants that uh, I previously shared the, the screen with them. Let me just share the screen here with the what I had from group map participants, and uh, let me find here our list of questions. Um, are you seeing my screen now? Are you seeing my screen with the questions from group now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, here they are. Who wants to take one of them? Can I like to start? Let's start out with one question. How do we humanize and still get all the work done before we need to do? I think this question is not uh, in sequential. For example, you humanize the, the conversation and you cannot get the work done. I think it's part and puzzle. I would like to build on what Jeremy just shared, right? Um, before you actually start that, that first five, 10 minutes, right? if you really make good use of it, right? You can actually break the ice, not so much of an icebreaker, job but really connect that brings in mind my first time when i leave singapore when i was in middle east i always wonder why my my client or even uh, my partners right they would like to spend for the first 15 or even 20 minutes to talk about what did i eat for bread in the in the morning and you know, what kind of pita bread did i eat what did i do the weekend i didn't realize it after a while then i they are actually engaging a conversation to find whether I'm actually ready to have a conversation with them later on, where I am in the space. And I think this is an important part. So if you work out, right, the part where you need to connect deeper into the space, I think humanizing and getting work done are not in conflict. In fact, they are de dependent on each other. They are actually the, what we call a interdependent pair relationship. If you do it well, then actually you have much less on processes. It's a lot more uh, deeper in the conversation. People will probably open up and share a lot more things. Yeah. And one of the tips that usually I would do is I ask myself this question. Beside the logical objectives, what are the emotions I need to look out for during the conversation? What are some of the, the blind spots I might see or I might not see? And I actually run through my head before the conversation uh, starts. And I may actually even prepare some of those questions right, to put in the room. You know, One example will be, uh, so far in the conversation, how do we feel? The word feel all right, could be one, are you happy with the conversation? Are we going too fast, too slow? Are we not being open or are we too close in our conversation? Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Peter. Who else wants to share something about this question, and then we'll go to the next, the other, the other one, Jeremy. Yeah, I don't think um, I don't think you can 
separate the two. You have to, uh, it's humans that are going to get the work done sometimes. So, um, I, yeah, it's, it's tricky, right? Because I know that with some of the, the groups that I facilitate, they don't like the corny icebreakers. They don't want to do all the fluffy stuff. They just want to, they just want to get the work done. So <laughs> they sit there and they go, oh, let's just get started. And so I think it's, uh, it is about, I think Peter said this before, you've got to read the crowd. And if you have a group that are stressed out, they're time poor, they need to get on with things, they're really, they're already engaged, then maybe we don't need to do certain things. If it's a case of, you know, everyone is cold, they don't know each other, and so you need to overcome that initial barrier for collaboration to happen before they'll start having, having those open conversations, then we've got to open it up a little bit more. So if your team has got past that, um, uh, sort of forming, storming phase and and your facilitation style doesn't need to accommodate that and they're just at the performance stage, then that's awesome. Um, I think of it this way with work like I do in sport. I play a lot of volleyball and um, sometimes I do some coaching in volleyball and if I have a team that already knows each other really well, we don't do a stand around a circle and say your name anymore. That's something we did at the start of the season, mid-season, we're already doing our drills um, and they're still really nice to each other. And then, but we're not, if we're not performing the best and we're not winning our sets, then you have to introduce conflict. So halfway during the season, you, are, you start to challenge the team with, well, what are we not doing better? And then how do they, you work out how they don't blame each other and uh, make sure that, you know, it's about the a particular strategy, not about a particular person. And you've got to manage that conflict through all the way to the end and then when the end of the season, you're celebrating that success. So the, the whole way through, you've got this process flow, but all the way through, you're managing the, the human emotion and the experience. So I think it's just part and parcel of the work we get done. What's the stage of the project you're in? What type of meeting are we at? Have we done this before? All that sort of stuff. Right. Aline, anything else you want to add, yeah. please? Uh, or comment on any other of the questions that we have here on the shared screen? Um, I think I just want to add on to uh, the question that Peter answered. Um, it's also about, you know, really designing into the process because you know that you want to humanize it and you know that you have an outcome you want to achieve. So in your whole design, you need to allocate and allow time for it to happen because you know that at the start, you sometimes if you come together a new group of people, it will be cold. So we have to uh, um, be patient and allocate time for that space first for people to feel comfortable with one another. And then, and, and when we are designing it, we also really have intentionally set aside enough time for that before we move on to the next uh, subsequent stages. And it's also important also that we need to manage the expectations. It's like, um, we cannot, let's say if the client would like to have um, this whole lot of outcomes, but we know that in that session, we may not be able to achieve that. So we need to manage the expectations of what we can achieve. And we also need to explain to the client, we need to have that kind of engagement during the session because it's very essential for the session to be productive and be meaningful for the participants. Uh, so it's like really from the start, you have to start thinking about it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you oh, so much, Lynn. Oh, I'd like to be on. Paul, like to be on link uh, answer to go to the other questions about embodiment, right? So moving from what Ling has shared, I think one of the aspects about uh, really hold, holding the space uh, is an important fact. The facilitator need to hold the space for the group. When they, I mean, there are many ways to look at holding the space. There are many literature, there are many philosophy and discipline, right? My simple way is very simple. I hold the space by being myself as a facilitator, but I'm also part of the team. So I'm actually part of, uh, from a systemic point of view, I'm actually part of the team. So when I hold the space, I can feel what the group is feeling. I can sense what the group is sensing. And I can also uh, kind of look at what direction are they pointing towards, how the outcome comes. So what is really important is the embodiment of facilitator beside your own practice on your reflection and so on. You need to bring that space into the room where you are neutral because being neutral will mean that you're able to hold your emotion at the very objective view. You are not citing anybody, but yet you can fire off impactful questions at anybody in the room so that the group will learn, right? So in a space of bringing up the conversation, we are drawing insights from the room. 
So that would be my answer to the other question on embodying part, right? And of course, behind that, you need a lot of practice. You need to know your tool very well for the first start, for the start. So you know how to maneuver your processes. But at the same time, you know how to actually manage yourself. You know, especially emotion part. There are times where I'm being challenged. They look at me, well, Peter, what do you think? Why are you always asking a question and not giving us answer, for example? It's <laughs> a challenging uh, question, you know? That like self-worth being challenged, your ego. You need to keep it way. I mean, keep it in a way that you maintain that, that posture, yeah. So that will be my answer to the other question. Definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, this is an enjoyable conversation so far. And interesting for me that as a participant of uh, facilitation uh, by uh, led by Lynn, because when she was doing uh, her assessment as a certified uh, group map facilitator, I was part of the, 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 the meeting that Lynn facilitated. And I noticed that there are such a difference in style uh, from a facilitator and, and the other. And, and sometimes what's difficult is to find a tool, a facilitation tool that's uh, adjustable to all facilitation styles. I'm wondering, uh, uh, Lynn, do, do, you, do you find it was comfortable for you to adapt your facilitation style to the use of group map and, and uh, comment me a little bit on your experience as a digital facilitator? So when I was, uh, what I, uh, I remember about during the assessment, right? You told you, you you reminded me even when we were preparing for the assessment, you reminded me that um it's the whole process and that I'm part of the whole um process of facilitation and I'm part of the whole process of utilizing group map uh, for the conversations. So it's like I shouldn't separate um uh, myself from group map. I remember that's what you said. Yeah, in the whole for uh, virtual facilitation uh process. Yeah. So, um, which reminds me that it's like, um, uh, like what I early, uh, Peter earlier said, I like that group map allows me, uh, it allows me to work from behind the scene. Let's say if I'm co-facilitating with someone, so, um, uh, that person that can be talking, then the person could have just WhatsApp to me or send me a message, Lin, can you please uh, activate this part? And I can just immediately activate it, uh, behind the scenes without anyone knowing it. Yeah. So I, I like that part. Um, and I also like that how it's, how do I say? Um, uh, it allows, how do I say? Uh, um, it allows like uh, me to take, because because of the flow that a group map has, it's like you can see when you brainstorm, then after that you uh, cluster and then you vote and then you uh, see the, uh, you see the results. I like how it's like it gives that process uh, really right in front of you because we when we do it virtually you can see that process happening and you can see like when you vote and so you can see the results right in front of you yeah because i know that there are some uh, platforms that i've tried before you, you you can't see the full results so throughout like it doesn't stay there it's like after a while you the res the voting will be gone but group map allows that so I, I think that is good and after that i can even save the results uh, for let's say if I comp can compile uh, into a report for clients, so that's what I like about Group Map. So, thanks. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing this. And Jeremy, what are the design principles? Because you are a facilitator from background, from many years of experience. Uh, as I already told you, everybody, you are a member of the IAF. So, what are the design principles that uh, uh, guide your team when developing Group Map? Because now I see there's a this this um, the, the 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 visual appearance also of the tool is important because we now can create maps with these beautiful beautiful backgrounds. But uh, can you expand on that? What are the the, the major design principles on on sure. when you when you develop group map? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, so, funnily enough, uh, group map came out because I was teaching in a classroom at the time. And uh, if you can imagine teaching a group of students, they're not always the easiest to keep focus and, and attention. So, <laughs> so uh, actually, the design principle was how do I compete with Facebook and Twitter for their for their <laughs> screen space? That was one. Um, oh, I think we interviewed a hundred uh, educators and and group facilitators around things that they did, and then we actually used the IAF's uh, facilitators handbook. You know that. Yeah. That white book with the, all those pages and a whole bunch of methodologies in there, but using their principles of the flow. So those three things kind of informed the, the design thinking space. We initially started off with just mind mapping. 
um, and the idea was to have a 3D mind map, but it came back down to bit, that was way too complicated, Jeremy, nobody's going to do that. So we ended up with these other sort of list making canvases, create your own template style activities, case studies that were designed for classroom. Um, and as you know, like group map doesn't have video conferencing tools and all that sort of stuff because we were, we never designed specifically for virtual, we designed for digital. Um, we were trying to make it so that if I was standing in front of a room, I wasn't writing down all the answers that everyone gave me and they would just copy it back down. We wanted them to do a lot of critical thinking. We wanted them to get feedback straight away. Um, and But then we wanted to have an artifact of that conversation. And if someone wasn't there that day or someone said, I, I can't remember what we said, there, there it is, you know, here's the, the written memory of the day. So I think, um, yeah, I'm not sure that my, my initial design values were all that strong to begin with. It was really just something I needed to <laughs> try and do and I had to compete with other tools for their attention. Um, but then over time, we've just learned, I guess, just from listening and feedback, what people need and want. And so we kind of use that as our as our mechanism for looking at our future roadmap. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Jeremy. And and Peter, can you expand a little bit on what's behind this this course on on certifying a, a group map digital facilitator? What's the rationale of this? Mm, sure, but anyway, first I so want to thank Jeremy for creating a good tool. It's my smile for him. Yeah, yeah, because of the word digital. So one of the concepts that I was been thinking, right? Why can't we, uh, before even COVID nineteen, why can't we actually bring uh, face to face and then virtual together? So I think this is a tool that I discover that allows me to do both sides. And so for this course, right, we are emphasizing a lot more. Uh, through learning group map, how do you bring the conversation together, either in the deep, in the virtual space or the on-site space? But a metaphor I like to to use would be. Uh, like a raft in, in a very rapid flow of water. So not most of the tool allows you only one direction, but there's an awe in the group map that allows me to steer as I move along, right? So in this course, we are teaching people how to move that steer with the awe in the hand and moving in the rapid. As I say, because it's a rapid, it's very fast, right? Most of the tool, you will be in trouble because you've got no time. You say, wait, let me, let me put a, a frame there. Let me put a sticker note there, right? There's no time for you, but group map allows you to do that. So in this course, we emphasize how you make use of this tool to suit your facilitation processes and style, right? But of course, at times, with some of the features in group map, we also teach you how to make use of some of the um, important feature, like for example, criteria and rating, right? To look at when you vote, what is the thoughts behind your voting? And we can actually discover insights from the rating you have, which many tools will not be able to do. In fact, if you do clustering on face-to-face, -face, you get people to vote, put a, a sticker on it, you can't really tell how much that rating uh, in summary is. But because there is almost like an AI function inside group man, allows you to do the rating, you can actually draw insight from that. So in this course, we also look at how you design this into the feature to allow you to draw deeper insight, not just a tool, but the tool allows you to be able to pull out important conclusion with the participants, right? So by and large, of course, we're looking at three things. One, we help you to use group map by going deeper into the group map and we certify you as a group map facilitator. The other one will be looking at applying good practices of a good facilitator, a professional facilitator, and immerse it into the tool so that at the third stage, the number three, is that you are able to bring in greater collaboration, humanizing the connection. Fantastic. It's, it's, it's really, really uh, a great, a great uh, sharing, uh, Peter, and I'm so grateful. So we are we already covered a lot of ground in this uh, uh, fire chat. Uh, um, chat on the fire chat on the fireside chat that was uh, uh, originally created by Jeremy in facilitation week and OFU. 
it, it was really, really great to have these guests here around me. Though, let's finalize now this conversation with one thought about what will be the, the impact of the vaccine. Are we going back to face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings and forget all about uh, what we achieved by starting to learn how to take advantage of the digital individual spaces? Or do you think that the, the digital facilitation is here to stay? A quick round, starting by Jeremy, perhaps. Then Lynn, oh, I, mean, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, isn't this the topic of your cocktail, um, your cocktail night? <laughs> we are obviously starting that. Yeah, on, on so, that. I love that question, Paul. Um, just because that is the kind of conversation you would sit around a table and, and have a drink and chat with your friends about. So um, it's definitely very interesting. I'm I'm just like anyone else. I'm itching to get back into travel and just see the world and you know be with people and all that sort of stuff. But I think you know at the same time we we also will understand that time is so precious and that digital can be not just time saving and insightful, but we've, we're going to have to learn to include people who's who might still not be in the fortunate position of being able to do you know, not be able to come to a meeting. So I think inclusion is going to be a, will be with us for a long time, not just because of COVID, but just cost, time, space, those sorts of things. Um, and I think there's certain things that digital facilitation can bring to the table around insight that you can't see, you know, as the facilitator, you have to do all the things where you're watching body language, sensing the room, doing all the stuff. You're not there to do the data analytics and do the drill down and look for congruence and correlation. And, you know, those sorts of things are where digital uh, data can be super, super useful in helping you decide on the outcomes and direction. So let the tools do their job and humans do our job and the two of them bring some magic together. And I think that's maybe what the future could look like with or without a vaccine. Definitely. Okay, you know, fo following alphabetical order, Lin, what's your view for uh, the next stage? Um, I feel that you'll stay virtual or digital facilitation. Um, so it's like, uh, it's a mixture of face-to-face -face and uh, doing it digitally. Because we have already had a taste of how we can do it digitally, right, virtually. And we have seen the possibility of doing it virtually, you know, and, and really including people from I I mean, I mean what I um I feel that the, the biggest thing that I took away from the whole COVID thing is really the op opportunity to really um get in touch, get engage with people from different parts of the world through the different sessions um internationally, uh um, that I attended. So that is really something that I feel um, it will still stay digital um, and it's, it's going to um, complement the face-to-face -face, um, sessions in future. Yeah, that's my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Lin. Thank you so much. Peter, last but not least. Okay. I definitely also miss the flying, uh, the traveling. Yeah, I was just telling my client today, I really miss uh, Taipei, for example. Yeah, I look forward to the the uh, early uh, what call uh, implementation of the vaccine. So at least I can travel more freely. But at the same time, I'm also excited about the prospect where uh, we bring digital collaboration in a wider space. I I'm look okay looking at the idea of inclusion. I think in this space, right, we found that uh, there are a lot of inequality because some people just cannot afford certain technology. But I'm very uh, hopeful that with the five G coming. Digital collaboration will bridge the gap, you know, because 5G can do a lot of wonders. And with digital facilitation, bridging all face to face and uh, virtual, I will see a marvelous. So I'll just give uh, uh, an example. If I have a big room with a big board with hundreds of sticker notes and I can put it into a group map, I can carry everywhere I go and my client can continue to look at a conversation, draw the data and then go to another space again. Right? I don't have to fold my board. Yeah. In the past, I had to fold my board, kind of take picture, and then do a lot of editing behind. Now I don't need to do that. So I'm looking forward to the kind of that space. And that's why we call it virtual, uh, sorry, digital collaboration rather than just virtual collaboration. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And just to remind you that uh, it's uh, here, uh, if you would like to uh, uh, join our next course on the 23rd of November, you can uh, register at digitalcollab.academy. You can find us. Uh, 
uh, in the, in the cyberspace there. Also, uh, if you have a client a client that you can find uh, interested in digital facilitation and you have trouble on that, please talk to us because it's it's always a pleasure to uh, expand on the knowledge of digital collaboration. And you have your the, the 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 experts in the field. You can talk either with Lean and Peter or Jeremy. Uh, talk to us uh, we we want to expand on digital facilitation worldwide so lean peter uh, and jeremy thank you so much for joining this conversation with us today uh, i wish you a rest of uh, evening or night right because where you are it's probably even late and the rest of the day for all the viewers that are watching us and uh, we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks with more conversations great thank you so much paul Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Thank, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.